DigitalJamSessions.com. Hello and welcome to this Digital Jam Session. We're coming at you live from the Cheltenham Science Festival. We're joined today by Steve Dan from uh, Amplified Robots slash Medical Realities. And we also have with us uh, Henry Price from GE. Welcome, gentlemen. Good afternoon, thank you. Would you care to explain for our lovely listeners exactly who you are and what you do? Now, Steve, you've been here before, so I'm going to start with Henry. So I'm an engineering digital apprentice. Sorry, de degree apprentice. So I've been working at GE for five years and doing a degree while then while I work for them as a side job, hence the involvement at Cheltenham Science Festival. And I'm here promoting GE in the UK, and we've got healthcare division, aviation division, all, all of the different industries that GE has in the UK. So we employ about 25,000 people in the UK, and we're showcasing all of the STEM um, activities that we have across all our businesses here. Wonderful. Thank you. And Steve, why don't you explain to us all about what you're up to at the moment? Well, I'll try and keep it short because it's, <laughs> it's quite a lot at the moment. As you know, uh, I'm the CEO of Amplified Robot and also the co-founder and CEO of Medical Realities. I do work in AR and VR, and I'm also the president of the London chapter of the VR and AR Association. Right now, we've got a lot of things on, both in virtual reality and augmented reality, in publication, in, in immersive gaming, and also in gaming and and publishing and medical. And in medical realities, we're at, we've actually just launched our first VR training module. So if anybody wants to see it, go to any of the app stores, Android, Oculus, or iOS, and go for medical realities, and you can try it out yourself. Wonderful, it's very exciting stuff. Okay, so today what I wanted to do was talk about the future of technology. Since we've got GE in the room and we're also here with yourself, Steve, I just wanted to talk about what we feel the future of technology is going to end up looking like. Now, in the pavilion that you guys have got here, I noticed that you've got a, a lot of different types of technology that you're toying around with. And you, one of the things that caught my attention, I remember commenting to Steve about it, was the uh, energy generation. So there's a power station, little mock-up of uh, a power station, etc., and so forth. And the one comment that, that I had with Steve when we were talking about this was that it was still focused on, on centralized energy generation. And I'm curious from your perspective, how you see the future of energy generation from a decentralized perspective. Okay. Yeah, so as you're referring to that model there, shows sort of a common distribution model you'd see here in the UK now. Mm -hmm. I think looking at where solar and renewables and wind come into it, definitely having a decentralized system and maybe having small towns with solar and battery storage is definitely the future as battery storage and the is able to store more energy as the batteries improve over the next sort of five to ten years. It's definitely going to happen. And do you think it's going to be a situation of people being able to generate their own energy, you know, in that moment? So things like PaveGen is a for example of that uh, walk to light uh, system that they have. So being able to put down paving that allows you, when you walk over to that paving, it, it, it generates the, the energy to power the lights above you. Do you see that as being something that we're going to see more of as we move forwards in terms of the, the way that energy is being created is not so much as, as uh, you know, an excess of energy being created, but very much on demand in the moment? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think as humans, we're missing a trick not being able to use the resources we have from the Earth, so like from the sun and the wind, and being able to store that so, and use that whenever we need to. So we could capture it all during the day when we're at work, and then at home when we turn on the kettle or the TV, we've got the energy stored and we can use that. Mm. I think in this country, we struggle maybe not having the best sunlight. I think when you watch the glossy videos from California and they have 300 days of sunlight, Yes, soda is great out there, but we've got challenges which engineers need to solve here to try and make it work in a cloudy environment. But we have a lot of wind. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of wind, exactly. So yeah, it's going it's to be a combination of things. And there's no sort of silver bullet solution. It's going to be a combination of different renewables, I think, that we'll look at. Okay. So Steve, from your perspective, you're working very much in the kind of immersive tech end of things. But one of the things that's, that's kind of becoming a little bit of a trend, I say with inverted commas, is artificial intelligence and the integration of artificial intelligence into immersive techs, be that VR or AR. And I'm kind of curious where we see this, this crossover of artificial intelligence and the application of that kind of te technology in things like smart cities, for example. I'm curious, Steve, from your perspective, First of all, how you see AI being used in the current context of the things that you're doing, and then we'll, we'll kind of look at that in the context of smart cities as well. Yeah, sure. I think that uh, AI, especially in the medical sector, is actually going to be very big. In fact, it, it's, it is now. IBM Watson has been running clinical trials for a long time now, and especially on actually finding out about cancer, screening people. So cognitive research and, and AI is actually looking very, very good. 
We're hoping to use it as well in medical realities because part of what we do is that we're part of the training curriculum and we want to, students to be able to ask questions as well. So the questions will be answered, hopefully, by an artificial intelligent sur surgical teacher. So we find that's going to be the only way that we can actually work it on a scalable mm -hmm. project. So we're really excited about that. So I think, that, I think that's the way it's going to be very big. But I think artificial intelligence is going to be part of what everybody is going to be doing and handling in the very near future. Okay. So before we jump across, first of all, the thing that's sticking in my mind as you say this is this idea that you're using artificial intelligence to be able to respond as a, te as, as a the lecturer to answer the questions. Do you see that becoming something that there is a risk that at some point further down the line, however far down the line this could be, where doctors are reliant on some kind of artificial UX UI where they're able to you know, have a patient in front of them and you know, the computer is telling them it could be one of you know, these 10 things and, and you're using a bit of human judgment, but fundamentally for the knowledge, you're using the AI or you're using the computer. Do you think there's a point at which the, there is a risk that medical health professionals become dependent or reliant on things like AI or the, the computer technology around them to, te to, to bear the brunt of the knowledge, the depth of knowledge that is required in these fields? Yeah, I think that's always a, always a danger. I think it's probably outweighed by the fact, in actual fact, it can actually cut through a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So really at the moment, quite a lot, of, especially in research and looking at certain patients, the doctors and surgeons, for instance, can't see the wood for the trees because mm -hmm. this is so much information. They need some, some way to filter that out very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Therefore, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. is going to be a great way to do that. But I think it, it always needs checks and balances. Mm -hmm. But the most amazing thing is that at Google, the engineers uh, who are actually writing the code for artificial intelligence intelligence mm -hmm. are finding that the artificial intelligence that they've written is better at writing artificial intelligence than they are. Mm. Now that's also a little bit scary. I do recall hearing a story about the artificial intelligence creating an, another language just to translate languages. Yeah, it's got, it's got even more scary than that, that, that it's actually sort of going, going past, yeah, it, it, they've actually created their own language, so it's mm -hmm. not English, it's not Chinese, it's not, it's not yeah. Italian, it's its, its own language. Mm -hmm. And they did that, that to cut through because the artificial intelligence has to communicate with itself. Mm -hmm. How does it do that? It's doing it by language, which it's actually created all by itself. But now it's actually creating artificial intelligence uh, sort of ideas and the way to go forward all by itself, which sounds really good, except that that's, this is, I think, if you read any, any sort of uh, science fiction author, they've always got a story about what <laughs> happens when artificial intelligence takes over and actually becomes more intelligent than we are. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, why would it uh, actually need us around at all? Oh, we're going into Blade Runner territory yeah. now. <laughs> But I'm curious, Henry, from your perspective, what the application of AI is from, from a GE perspective, or how do you see it integrating into some of the different verticals that you're working within? Sure. So AI for us is, 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 as Steve referred to, it, it's for data. So if you take a jet engine on a medium haul flight, that will generate about one terabyte's worth of data. And it's being able to use the AI, and we have this happening right now for all our aircraft engines. It's taken the 26 sensors, the one terabyte of data, and being able to predictive, to take them, sorry, to predictively analyze all that data and find out when it's best to maintain that engine, when parts are going to fail. Yeah. It's a huge, huge market for us. We're now transforming as an industrial company, as we're known to what we're calling a digital industrial. And we're now having our own industrial internet using our own operating system called Predix. So it's something that GE is getting to in a big way um, across all our industries. And we're sort of using this work on the GE store. So whether you're from aviation or healthcare or from oil and gas, you'll be able to use this digital approach and be able to basically crunch data and yeah. tell customers what they need and make drive efficiency really and productivity. Can I just say that in actual, I was amazed when I, when I heard about actually how the jet engines are being monitored all the time now and the amount of data that's actually coming back, it's actually mind blowing. And it's, I think it's really good. I'm happy to fly knowing that, <laughs> that, 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 that the jet engines are being monitored all the time and the parts are going to be replaced before they fail. Okay, so in terms of the utilization of AI and talking about data points, which I think it's very valid when you talk about things like an airplane and monitoring you know, propellers and things like that. But when it comes to human data and, and our personal data, I think there is still perhaps for people who are not part of these industries, this kind of slightly concerning question about how much of your data is going to be used and, and how much of it can be protected. Because we're getting, I think, closer and closer to that stage where there is no such thing really as privacy these days. And, you know, much as some people would like to cling to this hope that, that privacy actually exists, I think, I think that there is still, though, that, that fear of the lack of privacy. And I, I wonder whether or not, you, you know, you feel that 
it's over and done with now, we should just move on? Or is this something we should still be considering? Well, I think we should still be concerned about it. But to be quite honest, I still, I think we have passed that, <laughs> that, that, that point already. Yeah. And people have willingly given away a vast amounts of information about themselves mm -hmm. or allowed companies like Google or Facebook mm -hmm. to, in actual fact, extract very, very sort of personal data mm -hmm. and use it. So I think we've already crossed that bridge. Yeah. The question is, I think we should keep on looking at how these things are used because, yes, if it's, it, it, it's that classic thing. It's the, the more data you know, mm -hmm. the, the better. Sometimes you can have too much data and it's, it's impossible to figure out, you know, sort of mm -hmm. what fits where. But what worries me particularly, and I'll, I'll talk specifically about the medical side, mm -hmm. although it's not sort of relate, not solely related to that. And that's if, if you can actually ex get everybody's health records and sort of go through them and actually figure out what's going to happen to them in, in much the same way as you can actually tell when a jet engine is going to need to do part replaced, mm -hmm. you're going to be exactly the same way as a human. Oh, you're going to need something done in the next couple of years. You need a new liver. New, new liver, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, of course, that, that's good that, that people can say, right, oh, we, we can do preventative mm -hmm. medicine. But what happens if that information gets into the hands of the insurers, mm -hmm. for instance? Mm -hmm. You're penalised before it's anything oh, necessarily to even happens. Totally. And I've just come back from uh, America and the, the, it, it always amazes me how the, the health care over there is now so reliant on, on, on health that, mm. of course, Trump is rolling back everything that Obama was trying to do to make it a lot, a, a lot easier for we people. We don't do politics. <laughs> but no, it's not politics. It's, no, so this is just this is what's happening, isn't it? Yeah. So, so, but, but what's happening there is that, that the, if an insurance company knows everything about you and it knows that in actual fact you've got a high chance of getting cancer in your 50s or 60s or 70s, mm -hmm. then are they still going to insure you? Now, that's, that's, that, that's a very difficult ethical question. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how people are actually going to uh, square that circle. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw another one in the mix here, which is a story I saw very re recently where Harvard had a bunch of students who were accepted into Harvard in, in future class, and they were in a private Facebook group. So it wasn't a public face, Facebook group, it was a private Facebook group. Even so, it doesn't excuse some of the things that were said in this group, allegedly. And then on the basis of what was allegedly said in that group, Harvard then revoked their, their invitation to, to, to attend. And so these kids have, you know, Basically, it's, it's had a pretty detrimental effect on the, the future, yeah. their, you know, their academic future. I'm curious whether or not we see that kind of thing becoming quite a commonplace as we move forwards with data points and the kind of data that people are looking at when it comes to, to you know, the entirety of our lives. And I'm curious, Henry, from your perspective, you know, do you see there being kind of a way of connecting those dots in terms of the things that people are using, whether it's smart cities, whether it's physical objects, or, or whether it's their, their own social media? that these things are going to come back and I'm not going to say bite them, but you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, so I think it's worth saying as people just need to understand digital, digital is forever. Yeah. So I think people need to be taught that and then maybe in schools and start off early age saying that you've got to be careful what you post. You never know, say, when it comes out to bite you. But I think for from companies like G, their trust has to be there. It has to be told to the public how these things are going to impact them mm -hmm. and what the data is going to be used for. And some element of transparency, I think, is really important in these things because mm -hmm. yeah, you don't want technically your insurance company knowing because that might cost you more next year. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, understanding what the data is being used for, I mean, companies building that trust with their customers, I think that's the main thing that's going to support this. Okay. So bearing in mind that we're here at the Chatham Science Festival and there's a whole array of pavilions and tents with all manner of things to explore and experiment with, I'm kind of curious because you get to work with a lot of different types of technologies and you're, you're dabbling around. What is the thing that, that is most exciting to you at the moment? What do you think is, is the stuff that, that really you, you wish more people knew about that stuff? So from G's point of view and from my point of view, definitely additive manufacturing has got to be the way. So there's a new turboprop engine we're creating at the moment in the Czech Republic, uh, simplifying that from 855 components to 12 using 3D printing. Wow. And that's now scalable. G's been able to build factories using all this additive manufacturing mm -hmm. to retrain people into using those machines. So there's no loss of jobs or anything, They're actually creating more jobs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely additive manufacturing. And the personal one, battery density. I'm working in the aviation field. So being able to hopefully have an electric aircraft that can get you across Europe, I don't think it's too far away. I think I read Airbus thing about 2023. So wow. as soon as the batteries outweigh a gas turbine in terms of what they can store in energy, yeah. in terms of same equivalent to fuel, mm -hmm. that's when it gets exciting and aviation can actually start to be an emission saver for once. Wow. And also hopefully cheaper for the average consumer. What would hope? Steve, what about you? 
Well, there's a lot of things to, to, to look at. As you know, well, my passions are VR and AR. So I'm going to say those uh, things because <laughs> I always do. And also artificial intelligence, I think, is, is going to be really, really good. But it, it is exciting to see how all these things are coming together because that now you can do in virtual reality, for instance, you're going to be able to design things in three dimensions. Mm-hmm. So it's going to make designing components, etc., uh, a, a lot more interesting and mm-hmm. a lot easier. And then you can actually, because, because they're designed straight away in, in three dimensions, you can print them straight away from, so you can actually get, print those parts that you just created, for instance, and they, that's going to be really exciting. So, and the same thing with the, uh, augmented reality, whereby that you can have a, a jet engine appear in the room with you and you can actually view it at the same time with uh, other people in the room and sort of walk around it and talk about it and sort of see it actually in, in three dimensions to scale as well. I think that's going to be really exciting. Okay, so I'm curious then, what do you think is that significant shift that needs to happen in order to just kind of change the way that you do business? Because you're saying all of this about VR and AR, but the one thing I would say is, is that I haven't yet seen the killer app. I haven't seen the, the killer piece of content that you look at it and you just kind of, that is so obviously what AR should have been about. I, I've really not seen that yet. Well, I think I think there has been sort sort of killer apps because I think yeah. Tilt Brush is is sort of into into that sort of area. Yeah. But the killer applications are a little bit held back because, in actual fact, the hardware has still got a long way to go. Yeah. Uh, it's getting a lot better, and it, but I think that, that this needs to actually an intersect between the sort of creative ideas and the hardware that can bring those creative ideas into fruition. Mm-hmm. I think we still haven't reached that sort of sweet spot yet, so that's probably really what's holding it back. I think. Okay. And from your perspective, what do you think really needs to happen, be that a cultural mind shift or a technological shift in order to really kind of push forwards with what GE is kind of doing? So I think a lot of the work we're doing with schools in terms of coding and promoting that works really well. That's something that schools pick on. Technology, unfortunately, is traveling so fast, as you know, difficult for schools to keep up with the curriculum. Mm -hmm. But it's something that I think companies have a debt to go and do, and we do that uh, locally in Gloucestershire. So that's definitely one thing that needs to happen. I think the main thing is just getting people involved in it. We're at the GE Pavilion. To this week for people to come and see this new technology, get excited by it. I think people are guilty, maybe as engineers like myself, saying we've solved all the problems. We haven't. There's so many more problems to solve, and we need future engineers to solve those problems for the, for the benefit of all of us. Okay. Well, as always, we like to give our listeners a way to be able to find out a little bit more about you and what you're up to. We ask you to do that by sharing with us your social media handle of choice. What would that be, Steve? Tanya, my one is uh, my Twitter handle. It's at VR2AR, and that's number two. So VR2AR, and you can get through to me that way. Wonderful, thank you. And Henry? So uh, any of the online, if you search for GE or GE UK, and at GE Careers as well, if you're interested in a career potentially with GE, those are the best ones to go on. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for joining me. And thank you for listening. If you enjoy this content, don't forget to subscribe and review. And follow us on Twitter at Digital Jam LTD. Thinking of launching your own podcast? Speak to the GL Pro UK team, who handle all of our podcast service needs. Tell them that Digital Jam Session sent you and you'll get 10% off your first order. Find out more at www.glpro.co.uk. DigitalJamSessions.com